Good afternoon and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergun Kurlukovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at mythsandrealities.com. When people disagree, it is not always easy to figure out who's right. Kinship, marital status, friendship, religion, national or ethnic origin are not good reasons to decide what side of a controversial dispute is right. It is best to understand the underlying reasons, motivations and evidence. Ignoring, dismissing or censoring one side of an argument while totally committing to another may lead to division, polarization and antagonism, which in turn may result in intimidation, bullying and even terrorism. Case in point, the Turkish-Armenian conflict. Some people readily take the popularly accepted but seriously flawed Armenian claims at face value, totally oblivious or to and, and dismissive of the plethora of Armenian war crimes, hate crimes, revolts, treason, terrorism, territorial demands, and the resulting enormous Turkish suffering. To the official Armenian narrative, Turks react with a simple but heart-wrenching question. Where is the Turkish suffering in that narrative? My goal in this docuseries is to mobilize the forces of critical thinking in an effort to rectify misconceptions, stereotypes, and fallacies using research and scholarship. I take pains to use very verifiable facts and scholarly build my arguments on them. With that with what deftness I'm able to do this is left up to the viewer's discretion. For this process to be fair, the viewers must examine the evidence presented here without emotion or political considerations. This brings us to the concept of free speech. As you know, the US courts were created under Article 3 of the Constitution to administer justice fairly and impartially. According to the uscourts.com website, Freedom of speech, a right enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, allows individuals to express themselves without government interference or regulation. Freedom of speech is protected by the First Amendment in the following immortal words. I quote, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, unquote. The Five Freedoms First Amendment uh, protects our speech, religion, press, assembly, and the right to petition the government. Together, these five guaranteed freedoms make the people uh, of the United States of America the freest in the world. The problems arise, though, when the Armenian lobby tries very hard to restrict these freedoms to the Turkish Americans by systematic defamation, discrimination, intimidation, and political resolutions. I covered Armenian terrorism in episode one and documented Armenian falsifications in episodes two, three, and four. Then I detailed in episode eight how the highest court in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, decided in 2015 that Armenian genocide is an opinion and rejecting it is free speech. In episode 67, I explained how the missing ingredient in the much flawed Ar official Armenian narrative was critical thinking. It should be clear by now that we, the people of Turkish American heritage, do not see eye to eye on the characterization of the Turkish Armenian conflict. But every time we try to present our case, we are defamed, bullied, harassed, threatened, and even subjected to assault and battery. Speakers who scholarly refute the genocide claims in university settings are slandered, threatened, vilified, and subjected to endless campaigns of defamation. In the summer of 2008, issue of, it, of the intelligence report, the Southern Poverty Law Center reported that Gunther Louis, a professor emeritus of the University of Massachusetts, was part of a network of persons financed by the government of Turkey, who dispute uh, the tr that the tragic events of World War I constituted an Armenian genocide. Apparently, 
an Armenian employee ill-informed the misled uh, uh, SPLC. Thus, the SPLC, which has made important contributions to the rule of law and the struggle against uh, bigotry, was sued by the good professor. The SPLC lost and had to publish a retraction and apology and pay an undisclosed fine. Professor Louis remarked, and quote, I took no pleasure in commencing legal action against SPLC, but the stakes both for my reputation as a scholar and for the free and unhindered discussion of controversial topics were compelling. It must be possible to defend views that contradict conventional wisdom without being called the agent of a foreign government, unquote. In its apology, SPLC said, I quote, we now realize that we misunderstood Professor Louis's scholarship. We were wrong in uh, to assert that he was part of a network financed by the Turkish government, and we were wrong to assume that any scholar who challenges the Armenian genocide narrative necessarily has been financially compromised by the government of Turkey. We hereby retract the assertion that Professor Louis wa was or is on the uh, government of Turkey's payroll, unquote. SPLC further stated that what Louis has argued in his book, The Armenian Massacres in Ottoman Turkey, a disputed genocide and elsewhere, is that the present historical record does not substantiate a premeditated plan by the Ottoman regime to destroy because of ethnicity, religion, or nationality, as opposed to deport for political military reasons the Armenian population. In this view, SPLC said Louis is joined by such distinguished scholars as Professor Bernard Lewis of Princeton University. As additional troves of archival information come, come to light, Professor Louis advocates greater study of this contentious subject. SPLC affirmed that they deeply regretted their errors and offered their sincerest apologies to Professor Louis. In the winter of 2015, two esteemed intellectuals, Professor of History, Justin McCarthy, and the constitutional legal scholar, Bruce Fine, were scheduled to deliver talks at an academic um, platform at the University of Toronto, Canada expressing their views on a controversial historical event that took place 100 years ago in the Ottoman Empire. When the Armenian students found out about the event, they immediately waged vicious campaigns harassing the university president and for allowing the scholarly lectures to take place on one hand and vilifying the two intellectuals on the other. Learning about the Armenian campaigns suppressing free speech on campus I penned an open letter to the University of Toronto president on February 26, 2015, to support him. I titled my letter, Freedom of Speech, Only If No Dissent Is Expressed. I asked President Gertler if he could imagine a university, a vibrant place where controversial matters are freely explored, disallowing in dissent. Worse yet, disallowing dissent under intimidation of Armenian pressure groups? What kind of an institute of higher learning would that be? If we cannot openly discuss, discuss a controversial matter, any issue from abortion, immigration, gun control, gay rights, e economy, climate change, global warming, um, wars, politics, and others, then what good is a university campus? What side of an issue shall be deemed right and what views shall be suppressed? And who will decide on that? Will we have an opinion police made up of screaming Armenians regulating thought? I urged President Gertler of the University of Toronto not to give in to a bunch of radical Armenian students and allow ac academic freedom to be destroyed. Armenian students must think the freedom of speech is a right that, that can only be exercised if Armenians agree with the ideas to be expressed which should contain absolutely no challenge to the orthodox Armenian narrative riddled with flaws. With the December 17, 2013 verdict on Perinchek versus Switzerland, the highest court in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, has established 
that the events of 1915 cannot be proven to be genocide and therefore cannot be compared to the Holocaust. What is needed is reasoned debate, not censorship of dissent or intimidating dissenters into silence. Only civilized dialogue can bring peace and closure if based on concepts of fair memory and shared pain. Anti-Turkism and is Islamophobia, by far the biggest challenges to free speech, should be checked at the door prior to discussing the Turkish-Armenian conflict, a complex human tragedy engulfing all the people of the era and area, not just Armenians. Furthermore, Armenian war crimes and hate crimes can no longer be swept under the rug. Armenians had resorted to terrorism, revolts, treason, and caused 519,000 Turks and other Muslims to meet their tragic ends at the hands of Armenian revolutionaries between 1914 and 1920. Lacking historical evidence and legal support, Armenians focused on propaganda and political pressure using deceptive comparisons with Holocaust to establish credibility by association. That is why the UN, the UK, Israel, and many other countries do not accept the use of the term genocide to describe the Turkish-Armenian conflict. History cannot and should not be enforced by opinion police. This concept was eloquently expressed by the French historians who opposed the draconian denial laws in Appel de Blois. Quote, History must not be a slave to contemporary politics, nor can it be written on the command of competing memories, unquote. Blindly insisting on the false claim of genocide will cause one to commit the crime of conscientious consciousness called ethicide, which is extermination of ethics via malicious mass deception uh, for political gain. Victims of the crime of ethicide, ethicide uh, is, is truth. Understanding the other side of an issue is important. University is a place for enlightenment, not policing thought. Then in the fall of 2016, history professor George Gorridge of Baylor University, Waco, Texas, was prevented from delivering a lecture at California State University, Northridge, when screaming Armenian students raided the room and chanted repeatedly obscene slogans right into Professor Gorich's face until he left the room. Foundation for Individual Rights and Expressions or FIRE, whose stated mission is to defend the individual rights of all Americans to free speech, published a report dated November 15, 2016 by Susan Kruth titled, Historians Shouted Down at Cal State Northridge. Kruth noted that the protesting students comprised Member, members of Armenian Youth Federation and the Armenian Student Association. Kruth remarked, quote, shouting down speakers with whom you disagree is not appropriate conduct in a setting that is meant to be the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace of ideas is best served when members of the campus community add their voices to an ongoing conversation, not when some community members silence others." Unquote. Unfortunately, both Professor Gorich and students who may have wanted to hear about his book or engage in a public conversation with him were denied the opportunity to participate in the event as planned. CSUN declared that it was important for the university to be open to a wide range of visiting scholars even those whose ideas we may disagree with. Consistent with the First Amendment, the university wanted to punish those students who effectively forced the cancellation of the event through disruption. The cancel cul culture arrogantly displayed by some Armenian students dictates that scholars who want to express favorable views about Turkish or Muslim leaders must be excluded. That's the new suppression ideology adopted by the Armenian students, which would preclude talks by a wide range of scholars who could otherwise provide valuable insight into countless topics and stimulate important conversations among students and faculty. It was disappointing to see the Armenian students treat Professor Gorich in this way. 
she she wrote that she certainly hoped that CSUN would effectively discourage such wanton acts in the future. On the back cover of his book titled Cancel Culture, Alan Dershowitz articulates that cancel culture is a cancer in un-American democracy, meritocracy, due process, and freedom of expression. He writes, and I quote, it is metastasizing through social media, chilling creativity, endangering basic liberties, miseducating students, erasing history, empowering extremists, destroying hard-earned legacies, all without accountability or transparency. It is having a significant impact, not only on the people who have themselves been canceled, but on the many more who have been denied the, the music, the art, the teaching, the advocacy, and other benefits previously bestowed upon them uh, by those who have been canceled, unquote. Suzanne Nussel, the CEO of PEN America, a nonprofit organization founded in 1922 that works to defend the freedom of expression, states on page 58, uh, dare to speak, uh, and I quote, when an invitation has been properly issued by an authorized campus entity, administrators should rarely, if ever, override that decision. For a public university to decide that a potential speaker is unwelcome on campus, based on what they have said or likely to say, it would mean that the university administrators were unlawfully discriminating on the basis of viewpoint, unquote. Professor of law at Florida International University, Stanley Fish, writes on page 45 of his book titled Versions of Academic Freedom, Freedom, quote, at the heart of the First Amendment is an egalitarian commitment to the equality of speakers and their ideas, unquote. Playwright David Mamet appeared on Bill Maher's uh, April 8th show, 2022, to discuss his latest book, Recessional, The Death of Free Speech, and what, he, what the impact of cancel culture could mean for the future of America. He said, and I quote, we have to have free speech. Without free speech, we have nothing because if one group takes the high road, it doesn't matter which group it is. If they're in power long enough, we're going to have a police state. So when people who state an opposing view are not disagreed with, but are marginalized and canceled, we're going to end up with a totalitarian state because that's the way human nature works, unquote. I totally agree with this assessment. Cancel culture or call out culture is a contemporary phrase used to refer to a form of ostracism in which someone is thrust out of the social or professional circles, whether it be online or on social media, in academia or in politics. Those subject to this ostracism are said to have been canceled. The expression cancel culture has mostly negative connotations and is used in debates on free speech and censorship as we are doing right now. Everyone believes in freedom of speech if it's their speech, for get, forgetting that free speech is there to protect the dissenting ideas, not conventional wisdom. In his case study called Texting, Bullying and Free Speech, Dr. Scott Stroud, Program Director for Media Ethics at the University of Texas at Austin, makes this wake woke observation, quote, it is hard to decide where the freedoms granted by the First Amendment start and end. We can agree on certain problematic utterances that we wouldn't say out loud, but we are confident enough in those judgments to legally punish these speech acts, unquote. If all this was not enough, Another scandal rocked the California people of Turkish American uh, heritage. The petition site change.org that builds itself as the world's platform for change, canceled the petition after it garnered close to a thousand signatures from the public. Just like that. Reason? None really. The almighty oligarchs of the change.org, Cyberland, ruled that the petition violated change.org's rules. Exactly what rule did the petition violate? They would, they would not say. The Turkish Americans pe uh, petition was urging California Governor Gavin Newsom to veto the Assembly Bill 1801. 
I will read that petition for you to see if you find anything that violates any rule other than change.org oligarchs, bias and bigotry. Here it goes. Dear Governor Newsom, I'm writing to express my strong opposition to AB 1801, which would add April 24th, known as Genocide Remembers Day, to the list of state holidays and authorized community colleges and public schools to close down on April 24th. This bill would place an improper financial burden, burden on the state of California. The Legislative Analyst's Office informs us that adding a new state holiday would create significant general fund cost pressures, likely in, in the many tens of thousands of dollars. The perpetuation of this one-sided allegation has provoked in 1970s and 80s, a chilling level of violence right here in California by Armenians against Turks and Turkish Americans. Scores have died, many have been injured, while academics and scholars have been repeatedly threatened when, when they expose the many flaws and omissions in the official Armenian narrative. One professor's home was even firebombed. This bill ignores the facts and the law Genocide is defined by the 1948 UN uh, Genocide on Convention, uh, to which the U.S. is a party and which therefore binds the 50 states under the Supremacy Clause. In 1985, the UN Subcommission on Human Rights considered a report that referred to the Armenian case as genocide, but did not accept it. In 2001 and 2007, repeatedly, the UN declared that it had not accepted the Armenian case as genocide. In 2015, the highest court in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, has ruled that Armenian genocide was an opinion not supported by a court verdict, and rejecting that opinion is free speech. I believe that historians, not politicians, should judge this matter. The California State Assembly is not a historical commission. For all these reasons, I respectfully request that you veto AB 1801. Thank you. I'm afraid we ran out of time this week. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.